for Frozen, we had created these two sisters. I get caught up in them because they feel real to me. They feel like family. That's part of what drives us. For Frozen 2, there's a sense of responsibility and high expectations. These are some letters that people have written to the studio. My name is Rachel. I'm 15 years old. And Let It Go literally saved my life. To be working on a new movie with these characters that people love, this is a special time. It's nerve-wracking. I've never animated Elsa before. The challenge is carrying on what people fell in love with in the first movie. <laughs> in animation, you write a script, and then you record it. Ready? And then they go back to the drawing board, and it changes dramatically. Goodbye. It's probably the toughest time of production is a year out. It's when all the balls are up in the air and the balls start falling. <laughs> Every three months, we screen the film. It can be pretty intense, the feedback. I was confused. I had to take notes. We can write a new song. Maybe we have one song left to write, or maybe we have five. Yeah. I just don't want to let the fans down. Right. We made this movie for them. All right, ready? Into the unknown. They're an audience that loves these characters. Into the unknown. I wasn't prepared to cry at this. Into the unknown. If you can do better, you have to do it. I actually animated her based on videotaping myself. I can't believe I just showed that to you guys. Is that better? <laughs> it's an exciting time, but this is it. I guess you could say we're going into the unknown. Please welcome our moderator, People TV's Lola Oganike. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining me. Um, we are here for a wonderful, wonderful event. We're here in celebration of Into the Unknown, Making the Frozen 2. And this six-part event debuts worldwide on Disney Plus on June 26. Again, all six episodes will be released on the same day, June 26, on Disney Plus. Um, Frozen 2 became the number one animated movie of all time, and this docuseries covers the last year of production. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the team that made this a reality to join us. We have Adina Menzel, Josh Gad, Kristen Anderson Lopez, Robert Lopez, Jennifer Lee, Chris Buck, Peter Delvecco, Wayne Unton, Mallory Walters, and Megan Harding. Hi, gang. Hello. Hey. Hi. 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 Um, we were speaking earlier, and I said to you all that this documentary could not have arrived at a better time in the world. There's so much pain in the world right now, and parts of America are so divided. But to see this many people coming together, this many people of differing backgrounds coming together, and pouring all of their heart, blood, sweat, and tears, and passion, and talent and to a greater purpose. It's just so powerful. And for me, it was also a beautiful reminder of what the world can be if we all commit to working together hand in hand for the collective good. So thank you all. Thank you all for pouring all of yourselves into Frozen 1 and Frozen 2. And thank you for allowing us to come along with you all for this journey. As I mentioned earlier, I cried, I laughed, I sang, I gasped, I cried again. <laughs> Uh, this docuseries gave me all of the emotions. Uh, Adina and Josh, I want to start with you all. Um, the entire team here and all of the wonderful Disney animation artists are now a part of history. Frozen 1 and Frozen 2 are the top two animated movies of all time. Walk me through what this journey has been like for you. I'm glad you started with us because we did so much more work than anyone on the call <laughs> uh, from an artistic standpoint. So it's great. Right. It, feels, it feels earned. Um, <laughs> I, I had to do it, Josh. I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> what does it feel like? It's it's surreal. You know, I look, I think that it's been, it's almost cliche to say at this point that the first version, none of us had any idea what it was what what it was going to be we we all just hoped that it would work 
And then to immediately see on a global level, the response to not only the film, but to what became the anthem in many ways of our time, Adina's brilliant Let It Go written by Bobby and Kristen and animated so beautifully and created by this group. It, It sort of became something that I don't think any of us could expect. What's been really fascinating about Frozen 2 for me is how it's almost become something else as coronavirus has sort of locked us in our homes and as we're dealing with, as you said so beautifully, so many different issues that are so difficult. The themes of Frozen 2 have seemingly taken on a new life of their own. Um, You know, I find myself uh, no longer singing, ironically, this will all make sense when I am older, uh, or or thinking about, you know, stepping into the unknown, um, or even, you know, the profoundness of something like show yourself in this moment. Mm -hmm. It's all just weirdly taken on a a different life, Mm -hmm. Uh, even from the brilliant reception it had when it was first released. It's it, I'm it, trying it's to figure bu- out if Jen and Chris had some sort of psychic they were dealing right. with uh, right. three years ago, and they were like, there's going to be a pandemic, everyone's <laughs> going to move out of the city, <laughs> into the woods, and everyone's going to have to call up the sins of the past. We're all going to look at them to find our way and forward. Rec- and, reckon, and reckon with them all. And mm-hmm. there's going to be a global wrestling with all of this. <laughs> we, we were just trying to get enough sleep. I wish we had any <laughs> insight. But we were just. <laughs> so I, I can't call I, you for I can't call you for lottery numbers. Then Jennifer, is that what you're saying? <laughs> you can, but you'll lose a lot of money. <laughs> okay. Whatever she's enough. investing in, I'm investing in. Good. Yes. Yes. I'm right there with you, Kristen. But um, I'm sorry, Adina, you were going to chime oh, in. No, I, cut you I was, was-, was going to go to the to the micro of just being in the studio with everyone and and really being so grateful all the time that, you know, Josh and I and, and the whole cast, we like he said, we come in and we do our thing. We have a great time, but we get to be reminded of just how incredibly talented all the other people on this zoom session are and having been a fly on the wall and them allowing they're always so collaborative and they always allow us to see their process which i just find i'm awestruck you know and it and it and it humbles me being in something like this where you just see how how much work goes into it and um i just you know being sort of being a part of a family that um that has uh, uh like you're saying, resonates with so many people in what we do. But just getting to admire everyone's talent is what was the most fun going to work every time. And what a family it is. Jennifer and Chris, you all share one giant frozen brain. Um, Let's talk about the incredible pressure you two were under. You You talk a little bit about it in episode three, Jennifer, but with Frozen 1, you were building with no expectations. With Frozen 2, you've got a global blockbuster under your belt, and you're trying to catch lightning in a bottle yet again. I mean, that's the pressure Olympics already, and then you invite cameras to document the entire process. Why, Jennifer and Chris, was it important for you all to share that moment? And were you at all reluctant about letting cameras in to follow you through this, this intense journey? I think we were um, innocent on two things. I think when we, we looked to do a sequel because we Miss the characters, we love them. Uh, the world was asking questions that we were asking, like, why does Elsa have powers? And they felt just at the beginning of a real journey. And that's where we went into it. And I think the pressure we felt much more as we got closer realizing uh, it's been six years and people are still asking us about the film. Um, but I think in terms of letting people come in and, and film us, I, I loved when I grew up, um, you know, uh, Wonderful World of Disney, whenever you get to see behind the scenes and see how they did what they did. I'm so overwhelmed um, by what the studio does, what every artist, every technician does to get these films going. And it's it's such a um, unique process. So I think my head, forgetting that we would end up on camera, was a bit more to, oh, people are going to get to see how they do it. And I, I loved those things as a kid. So I think it was more, again, innocently, the excitement. And then, you know, yeah, then later you have those moments where you're like, oh, God, you know. <laughs> uh, Chris, for you, what was that like having cameras roll during probably some of the most intense 
pressure filled moments of your life. Yeah, Casual. They, 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 <laughs> they were so great. You know, they became part of our family. And you just sort of, you forgot sometimes that, that they were actually documenting something. We would joke sometimes, like, please don't, please don't put that in a thing, please. <laughs> and some, and they did actually. So, um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, it was fine. I will go back to the pressure thing just real quick in that I think we put pressure on ourselves all the time on every movie that we make. Um, so the, the pressure is like inside the story room. And so it really, I mean, it was a little different, a little bit more, but I mean, it was still the same pressure that we do with every film. Uh, Peter, I've got to ask you, you're producing Frozen 2, you're approached about having cameras document the entire experience, and you say yes. Why did this appeal to you? And why did you put your team through this? <laughs> well, I think for a couple of reasons. Um, one, when we made the first movie, we, we knew we had something special, but like Josh said, no one knew the phenomenon that it would become. Right. And there was something about starting the process again. I, I almost wished we had documented the first film. Uh, mm -hmm. That and just for people to see the collaborative nature of what we do, uh, um, I, you get to see the animators, the lighters, the effects artists, all the departments, everything together uh, that has to work like clockwork to, to make the film. Uh, and I think you, you don't, most people don't understand uh, the number of people it takes and, and the hard work it takes to put these films together. So I think initially that is what we wanted to show the world. Although I will say, be careful what you wish for sometimes because actually having them there for that year was, was a tough process. Was everyone immediately on board? Did you have to cajole people? Did you have to offer them Disney stocks? Uh -huh. I mean, was, how, did, how did you go about convincing everyone to, to come join that journey with you all? Well, in terms of working on Frozen 2, that was easy because Chris and Jen, as soon as they said we wanted to do Frozen 2, we knew that we would only do it if, if the cast, if the Bobby and Kristen, and if our whole team that we put the first movie together with joined us. And because that first movie was such a special moment in time, actually getting people to sign up for the movie uh, was easy, including people who didn't animate on the first one, didn't, uh, um, they, were, they were also excited to take the second journey with us. As for the uh, documentary, um, right. <laughs> it was a little bit uh, a mixed blessing. I mean, I think people were happy, but also slightly intimidated by having cameras uh, follow us everywhere. All right, Bobby and Kristen, you two are one of the only sure bets in the entertainment industry. You two will be guaranteed to write a hit song. <laughs> you created one of the best. <laughs> it's true, Josh. You agree, right, Josh? <laughs> I do agree. I, they're insane. They're, it's, it's, it's insane what they do. I also have to say that I'm very intimidated seeing the animators because I just watched it and you guys are so freaking like, I know these guys and they they have hero <laughs> worship forever for me, but you guys like really watching this, I, I, you're like, I'm blushing because I'm like, you guys are so genius. It's incredible. <laughs> but yes, back to Bobby and Kristen. Right, they and, don't, and, they and don't listen, we'll, we'll, we'll get to them in a minute. We'll get to the animators in a minute because Mallory and Wayne, you all do some things in this documentary that just, I mean, mind blown. But I do want to start with Bobby and Kristen first, because just watching you two in the studio collaborate was just such a gift. Um, one of the many thrills of this docuseries for me was getting to see your entire process. Walk me through the decision to share that process with the world. And were you at all reluctant about pulling back that curtain? I mean, Josh and I thank you for that. But <laughs> again, were you at all worried about pulling back the curtain on your process? Um, I, think, I think that ultimately we're so happy that everyone gets to see the amazing pieces of the puzzle and, you know, the animators and the lighting and the sound. And, and ultimately, we learned a lot watching the documentary ourselves. Um, when, when it was happening, it, we didn't quite realize when we said, sure, that sounds fine, that it would be so weird when a camera showed up. We write in an in a apartment in Brooklyn. Like mm -hmm. we, we were Zoom workers before Zoom workers were a thing. Um, we've been Zoom, Zoom commuting for 10 years now with this guy. <laughs> um, so to have cameras show up, like 
They didn't just bring one camera. They brought like three cameras and a sound guy and they just had a lot of stuff. The fuzzy thing that's in your face. And like oh, someday yeah. we don't the boom mic. On, <laughs> we don't put on real pants. Um, I mean, again, this is not <laughs> This isn't new for anybody else um, now that you've been in the pandemic, but that was how we lived before a pandemic. And so to have people come up and like want to film us, it felt like there's nothing to film. I think if we had been in an office, it would have been a very different, we would have already put ourselves together. Yeah, um, for, for a song, for us, a songwriting is sort of like a very private thing that happens between a man and a woman. <laughs> when two people love each other very much, <laughs> they go into a room and they start playing the piano and they give birth to a song. <laughs> so it did feel very... I um, love the musical birds and the bees and never explained <laughs> in that way before. Thank you for sharing that. I love it. To have cameras there uh, was very much, it felt, it felt like having cameras for other private things you might do. Um, like what? <laughs> <laughs> Boofing, <laughs> and, and so what we would do often is we would say like, oh, we're so busy, we're so busy. We'd write the song, the bulk of the song, and then we would let them come while we were recording because a lot of creativity happens while we're recording a demo. Um, we make a lot of the small tweaks, but it's not, it's not like sitting in a room with more camera people than the two of us going like, okay, what does Anna say here? Because that's such a private sort of play date play date kind of experience. You have to be right. free to jump up on the couch and be Anna. And it would have felt really strange with cameras there. That said, I wish I had thought to diet and drink less before all the cameras showed up. Because <laughs> there was a lot of pressure. And now, now I'm like, oh, Kristen, oh. <laughs> when I watch it. Absolutely beautiful. And oh. <laughs> again, watching you two commu communicate through song and create those masterpieces was just, again, such a gift. I know when we were last together, a lot of singing occurred. And uh, I didn't know if, if you just felt like breaking into song, Bobby and Kristen, right now. I mean, I wouldn't stop you from breaking into song. I mean, if you, if you want to break into song, you can. Oh, where's where she oh. going? They did this all the time. Really? What, yeah. What's happening? I'm excited. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes! I don't know what I can sing. We're in 42 acres of woods, and I'm very allergic. Yes, the wind was a little bit colder, and we're all getting older, and the clouds are moving on with every autumn breeze. Peter Pumpkin just became fertilizer. And my leaks a little sadder and wiser, but why I rely on certain certainties. Yes, some things never change, like the feel of your hand in mine. Some things stay the same, like a wing in a line, just fine, like an old stone wall that'll never fall. Some things are always true. Some things never change. Um, that made me very, very happy. Thank you very much. I will be holding on tight to that moment for the foreseeable future. Thank you so much. Um, can I say, can I say something? Yes, I Adina, feel like come on what in I here. What I loved um, watching this was how vulnerable Jen and Chris or Kristen and Bobby would make themselves in these creative processes. It's so, I mean, just knowing as actors getting on a stage and what we do, it's just so terrifying to bring ideas and to have to sit there and have all those people in a room, you know, criticize. <laughs> Yeah. And you guys just, I mean, you're so brave to do that and be, and to throw your heart in it and to, and, and to be, and to remain open for, to, to allow the work to keep progressing. I just, I guess I'm so lucky you all have each other because you're, you support each other in such a beautiful way that I don't think is always the case in a lot of projects that I've been a part of. And so, um, 
it's a really it sets a really good example for I think people to see this documentary and to see what it's like to love the people you work with and how everyone can thrive and their ideas whether they end up sticking or not everyone's in a very safe place. Thank you. I, I will say out to Bobby and Kristen's credit and we we got to know each other. I'll never forget the day I saw them for the first time in a note session for Frozen. I wasn't even on Frozen yet. Um, and uh, and had no idea the journey we'd get to go on together, but um, it's it's about trust, as you said, Chris, uh, Adina and Kristen and Bobby and Chris and our team. That trust you you share your whole life with each other in order to inspire these characters to be three dimensional. And you guys, Josh and Adina, come in and you've done you do the same. Adina was so such an inspiration for Elsa, um, inside and out, and like those things, letting yourself bring your who you really are. Um, and be vulnerable with your the, your creative work is I think we we knew it was the only way we could go. But it, it's one of those things I I know I can't take for granted is when you build that place of trust that you can just I mean you've they've seen the worst of me um, and rarely the best but uh, but it's that it's the this whole team it's that it's that vulnerability. Thank you for mentioning because I do think it's the thing that I will never forget is being able to be with all of you, um, the most genuine, and bring my worst ideas, and you make it cold, so. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that's how it went, Jen. <laughs> I would say that we are all, um, you know, earlier we got introduced as like people who write hit songs, and we, we are those people when we get to work with the best of the best, which mm. is you guys. Um, there are plenty of songs on plenty of projects that no one's heard of, because, <laughs> because it wasn't with you guys. Oh, that's fantastic. But Kristen and Bobby, you are double EGOTs, so we just drop that right there for a little bit. For I'm a go-go. I mean, <laughs> he, he's a double EGOT. Um, if you don't mind if I brag on him, but I, I'm just no. a go-go. I need to You're get Emmy and <laughs> You're on your way. You're on your way. I'm not worried about you at all. <laughs> um, Megan, I want to talk to you about how you came to be a part of this docu-series and what was this process like for you? I mean, it seemed, it looks to me like you had an, an embarrassment of riches in terms of filming and it also seems like you had a lot of access. So could you walk me through how you went about becoming a part of this project and how you went about getting so much access? Um, yes, I can. I, I think it's worth going back to 2014, where I work with a company called Lincoln Square Productions, and we had partnered with the animation studio to make a television special for on Frozen 1. But it was 2014, so it was a year after the film had come out. It had, been, it had become this big success. It had won Oscars and done all this amazing stuff. And that was the first time I met Jen and Chris and the Lopez's and Wayne and Peter and everyone here. And they started telling these great stories about how Frozen 1 had come to be. And, I, you know, we were just go back to New York because we're based in New York and we go, that would have been so great to film to actually see that happen when rather than just hear about it later. So when we heard that Frozen 2 was happening, we approached the animation studio and said, would you be interested in allowing us to do this? But right from the very start, I think there was an incredible commitment that we all wanted to make something that was very different to a traditional behind the scenes you know, special. It had to be true, it had to be honest, and, you know, it would tell you how animated movies are made, but more than that, it was really about that creativity is really hard. These movies don't just come out fully formed. They are hard won, you know, by many talented people, and um, that meant that people had to be honest and brave and fearless when we came by, which, you know, everyone was, even when I'm sure they really didn't want us there. Um, it was really extraordinary to witness right across the board from people just allowing us into that process. I mean, 
I think because we shot for 115 days. Wow. So we we became a part of the furniture too. Like I think <laughs> at a certain point, people just forgot that we were there and like we'd wheel wait, our wait, property. Wait, 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 let let me, Megan, let me ask, is that true guys? Did you ever forget that Megan and her crew were there? <laughs> Sometimes, oh, yeah. Yeah. All the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. All the time. Only when they ask us direct like questions is when we'd be like, oh, no, yeah, oh, God, wait, <laughs> you know. Only at Disney Animation. We would, you could easily forget them there. When, when they were in our tiny little apartment, you knew they were there. <laughs> that is very true. That is very true. <laughs> it was a more intimate experience. In <laughs> but, Megan, did you have to negotiate access? Did you essentially say, I'm going to, I'm going to need you to give me give me a lot of room to play here because I, mean, I don't I, have access or was it a pretty much uh, a foregone I mean, conclusion that you'd be able to run wildly through this process with your cameras in tow? Well, I do think it comes back to that commitment. Like I believe that everyone wanted to make this a truthful document of how you produce these incredible movies. And yes, we would go to Peter and say, Peter, can we film this? And he'd say, hmm, maybe not. And then we'd go back and we'd ask again. And, you know, and it was a backwards and forwards. But ultimately, everyone was very on board to make sure that the documentary series was truthful as well. You know what I mean? Like, everyone could weigh the value of what we were doing. And, and that allowed us more access. I mean, we're just really lucky to have this incredible group of people um, and be documenting them. It was an extraordinary opportunity for me. I do think the hardest room was the story room, to have them in the story room. Mm -hmm. That is where you are most vulnerable and, you, and it's very um, intense. Mm -hmm. But then I'd get excited that they were in animation because I'd be like, oh, we're gonna do Show Yourself today. They're gonna get Show Yourself. So um, there's some parts that was really fun because you knew people were gonna get to see how something was coming to life. I think they were very patient with us with our moods in the story room as we we're trying to f make everything add up right, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm particularly oh. happy that they went to visit our orchestrator, Dave Metzger, in his studio to mm -hmm. show him at his computer doing what he does, because what he does is so underappreciated and so mm -hmm. vital to the music sound, sounding as good as it does and telling the story as much as it can. Um, not only that, he's just like the most cuddly teddy bear of a guy, <laughs> and I think he kind of steals the episode that he's in. That is true. That is very true. I mean, that was definitely a part of it, wanting to show as much of the process as we possibly could. But, you know, we had months of footage, months of footage, and we had to really whittle it down into the six episodes. You know, a lot of sacrifices had to be made there. But, um, you know, luckily, the, the, the main series arc is the show yourself and Come, the coming together of that, which really is such, it, it's so great for a viewer to witness just that process that it goes through from the very start to the final orchestral session on that. One of the uh, most wonderful things that I witnessed during this process was watching Mallory at work. Mallory, <laughs> I had no idea just how physically demanding animating is. I just watching your process of watching that moment when you create the final shot of Elsa for the Into the Unknown song and you had your boyfriend film you running and leaping like Elsa for reference for your animation, running through the streets of your neighborhood. He's tagging alongside on a skateboard <laughs> so he can catch all that footage. Anything that you wouldn't do for this film because it seems like you definitely threw your whole body into this. Thanks for saying that, Lola. Um, it definitely is, it's a very physically demanding job sometimes. It kind of depends on what you're working on at that moment. Um, I had never animated a character running in a film either. And I remember being like, how am I gonna do this? And it was actually my boyfriend's idea. He's like, I could just jump on a skateboard because the camera was moving and I was running and you wanna try to get whatever reference you take to be as accurate as possible to the shot so that it, it's more informative that way because that's what we use it for. So that was really, really cool to get to do that and get to collaborate with him on that. And um, 
you know, so it depends because other shots, you know, I might just, it might just be a chest up acting shot where I just, I jump in front of a camera, but either way I'm putting just as can be your head on reindeer bodies. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was another that was, great shot. <laughs> that was never meant to see the light of day. <laughs> so uh, the fact that that's in there, I was kind of really hoping that that didn't make it in there, but uh, it's, it's out there now. So that, that was wishful thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of knew. I kind of knew, especially when they said, can you send us that reference file? Um, but sorry. yeah, sorry. <laughs> Regardless, <laughs> I think no matter what I'm working on, you're always putting a little piece of yourself into it. And I think that's what makes animation so fun. It's really what draws me to it is I get to play as Elsa. You know, I'm sure I'm sure, Josh, you feel that same way, too. You get to be Olaf for, for a moment. I feel that way about playing Elsa, too. It's really, <laughs> it's always exciting and um, and, and, I, I yeah. was, I was honestly like that was because we don't. I didn't get to see any of that. So your face on all of the different Kristoffs was <laughs> one of the highlights of the series for me because I was just like, oh my god, yes. or or what's his name doing the Olaf stuff? I just I've never I've spoken to all of you guys so many times and I've and I've sat with you, but I've never actually seen you guys. And what's so, what Adina said earlier, and it's so true, is that vulnerability and that bravery to just take on this stuff and share it. Because I'm not gonna lie, I was, as Bobby and Kristen know, I was so intimidated with the cameras around because you feel so vulnerable. So when I was singing my song and suddenly had <laughs> people like recording me, like, what is this? We're doing an animated film. And it was just so like intimidating, but you guys are just so, you're, you're so badass in it. It's, it's amazing to watch. But Josh, I have to say watching you dance in the booth just brought me so much joy. It seems like there was a moment when you were actually able to forget that the cameras were there. Uh, I, yeah, I tuned that part You're like, out. yeah, no. <laughs> I, no, I was, I, I had to come back and re-sing it. Remember? I wasn't remember gonna guys? say, unless you said it. We- No, we, I had to come back had... and re-sing it because I was like, I want to, I want to do it again. Again, like, I'm not Adina. Adina is, she goes up in front of like 50,000 people and she's like, oh, that was a small audience. I <laughs> get intimidated if like, there's more than three people in a room while I'm singing, so. Well, Josh, Josh is in front of a, put him in front of a microphone and he will create gold. Yes. But I would say that particular day reminded me of in the documentary Free Solo, when the guy goes up to climb oh, right. and then he, he decides, I'm not going to do it today. If I do this today, I'm going to die. And then he says to the guy on the radio saying like, having the cameras there is making me not able to do the thing that you have the cameras there to film. Mm. Um, and there were a few moments where that would happen where where you just realize like whatever energy shift is happening is yeah. actually making it impossible to do the thing they're all here to see we fell off the metaphorical mountain a couple of times but luckily uh, you can't die from that <laughs> <laughs> i was i was like I, I, I my frozen process is so intimate and when i when i am creating music or lines for olaf it's like our brain trust is just like, it needs to be this, or I start to feel a little like naked and I can't experiment and play. It was, we it was weird. Have those cameras, there's always cameras, even without the doctor. That's They're different. Always That's different. Running. Right. They don't have Megan with her Australian accent. <laughs> but those are for the animators. So, and that's what, so they have the reference. Yeah, um, it doesn't, yeah those, those aren't cameras, the same. Yeah. Those cameras don't come with, can you do that again? And this time do it. <laughs> in front of us yeah. and I'm going to bring in five additional people to take a look at you. <laughs> you nailed that accent, Josh. I like that. You nailed that. Really nice. <laughs> you are very talented. <laughs> I don't know what accent that was. So let's it was moving. close. It was close. Was, I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed. Let's keep going. Wayne, <laughs> as the supervising animator of Elsa, you have been with Elsa as long as Adina has. Um, there's a great moment in the docuseries when you and Adina sit down to talk about Elsa's significance to you both. Can you share that moment with us? Because for me, it was just one of the most powerful um, 
moments of the docuseries. And Adina, uh, feel free to chime in after Wayne has spoken about this moment because it was just really, for me, powerful, tender, quiet, and, and, and just very special. Hi, sorry, oh, yeah. people are texting me. I guess the trailer just came out and they're, they're, they're texting me. Like, I'm like, go away, go away, not, not right now, not right now. <laughs> I, just, I just threw my phone away <laughs> across the room. That's good. Oh. You're, a little, you're a little busy right now, just a little busy. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, talk to me about that moment with you and Adina in the theater speaking about um, Elsa's significance to you both. We talked about a lot of things. Uh, Elsa, Elsa is, is, you know, it's such a joy to work on that character. Uh, I, I feel like it, um, the films, you know, both of them, I think they speak to many people and, um, especially that character. Uh, Elsa is very close to our hearts, um, but to see, you know, people uh, relate to her and, you know, it's, it's so, it's such a, uh, a cool thing to be a part of uh, bringing her to life. And, uh, and then to see that reaction from, from many people and, and that, you know, some people have spoken to me directly or sent messages and saying like how that, uh, you know, they can relate to her and it's helped them through many, many things. And uh, I, actually I was sharing with Adina during that, that talk about how um, she actually, uh, Megan had mentioned this, there was a, a, docu a, a documentary on TV for uh, the first Frozen. And in it, I, I mentioned about how Adina had come in. Uh, she would come in a lot of times to talk to the animators and um, uh, she came in and I don't think she realized how many of us were there. There were, I think at the time for Frozen 1, there was 70 animators and they were all, we all wanted to see her uh, talk. Uh, and uh, she was going to talk to us about singing and uh, the craft and like, you know, what happens with the body when, when you sing and they let her in. And I just saw this, this dread on her face. Cause I didn't, I don't think she knew that it was going to be, I thought it was, it was just going to be like maybe a few of us but it was like this whole room crowded with animators and I felt so bad. And I had mentioned this in the, in that documentary that it was, it was really cool because um, you could see she was, she was nervous. She was really nervous. Uh, but then uh, when she started seeing uh, let it go for us, there was this power and we're, we're looking at things like, you know, uh, Adina, we we, we met, we talked about this, like, uh, how we would be looking at the way you would have your hand positions and we would just be doing sketches and things and just taking notes like what is it about Adina that we could bring to the character uh, and then what I thought was really cool was that there was this kind of like vulnerability and and there's that's and then there's also this power there and that's Elsa and so that was one of the things that I was looking at like oh that that is that's her. And so I mentioned to Adina, like, you know, when you see all these, you know, kids and the audiences, you know, they, they love this character. That's a lot of that is, is you uh, to Adina. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was just really nice to, to, to talk uh, with, with you, Adina again. Uh, we had, you know, we she talked, comes in. Yeah. And, we talked for a long time. Yeah. Adina, um, to me, that was really one of, um, one of the more poignant moments because you talked about how sometimes in real life you are vulnerable, you are insecure, but in your music and in this character, you find, you find tremendous power. So I'm so glad Wayne brought that up. I was hoping that you could speak to us about that as well, because I think it's a point that's worth reiterating again and again. Well, it's interesting because, um, well, first off, I just want to say that I feel like I owe Wayne so much, you know, to, this, this little, what we call it, a marriage or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, what his work has literally changed my life. And then the, the way that he has integrated who I am and my soul and my essence into this character that I'm so proud of is just something I'll have forever and my son will have. And so like, I just, you know, I, I worship you. <laughs> um, and I also... I feel like the, the interesting thing about Frozen for me is that it resonates with so many young kids. And yet, as a woman, um, it's still something I contend with. The, um, 
this idea of stepping into my power and something we don't lose. Maybe that's why she's, why she's uh, speaks to pe people in such a broad way. And um, what I actually loved seeing about Jen and Kristen too, these two powerful women mm -hmm. doing so much, making themselves vulnerable, but being in such powerful positions, not afraid to make their choices and decisions and take risks. I mean, there, it was, I really love that, that the, documentary um, celebrates them as these working women as well. Yeah. But it really helps that there's two of us. Like that <laughs> is, it, it, it's No, you're still a mom and you still have your girls and there's just some, no offense, Bobby, but it's just, there's, there's a lot going on there. And, and the fact that you can remain creative and come up with these lyrics and, and, and do what you do. I'm just, you know, so. I mean, yeah. What I mean by that is, is it's so powerful to have, to not be, the only one of something in a room because yeah. so yeah. often in our careers you're the only wow. woman in the room um and so you're like well that's not really how it works guys and if you you speak up about that but you're the only one then they you don't listen you have jen i get it i thought you might have Bob say like it, like when if you're a sister and you're mad at your sister it's probably not because he stole your boyfriend it probably goes a lot deeper and a lot earlier and to be able to turn and and Jen go, yes, this is true. Like when sisters are, sisters have something between them, it yeah. starts very, very early and it's much deeper. Um, and you know, it, it was just helpful. It, I, I, I've always valued so much having, having Jen in the room as an ally. And now Jen, and the, Jen is like in all the rooms where it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I know we've got to open it up for questions really quickly, but Jen, I wanted to speak uh, about you being in all the rooms and having to wear so many hats. I um, mean, you're one of the pioneers in this industry in terms of leadership. And in addition to being the chief creative officer at Disney Animation, you co-wrote and directed Frozen 2. You were a single mother. One of the best moments for me was watching you print out your daughter's math homework as you show up at the office at 5 a.m. to write and you write from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the weekends to get this all done. And it was just really, again, Adina mentioned it earlier and, and Kristen alluded to this as well, but just watching you sort of demystify this idea of this woman having to be a superhero and just, uh, and just speaking to the idea that, yes, we, we, women can juggle a lot, we need help, but we can get it done. And, and just how you gave a shout out to the single moms out there. I just thought that was really powerful. And I'm so glad that you and you felt vulnerable and comfortable enough in, um, in your own power and in, in your own story to share that with the world. So thank you for that. Thank you. No, it just, I, you know, I, 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 I mean, my mom worked two jobs as a single mom and her, both her kids went to college and grad school and, she gave us everything. So I think uh, I had a very inspiring mother for, for that. But I'll say, you know, I think what I love so much, and this is where we talk about trust and vulnerability, is um, Peter and, and uh, Chris, who were in person with me every day, the Lopez's uh, every day virtually, and then uh, all those who came in, and is, is we, uh, they made it for a space where I can say, here's what I need. Here's what's going on now. Family comes first for all of us. And we, we just gave each other permission to say, what do you need? Um, I feel very, and I, also, I know how lucky I am. Um, I'm invited into, I was invited into the rooms before I was asked um, to, to be there <laughs> mandatorily, I guess. But um, I think it's just this, creating this space of how we support people to bring out their best work is the environment we have. And that's an environment that, um, connects very deeply with me that that everyone's valid in the room and what they bring is important and from there trusting the best will come um and that's that's how we worked and so that's how we work now but um you know it it, it wouldn't have been possible um and i think that's an important thing for all of us that we um can have that that relationship at work where we bring our whole selves that we're able to bring our whole selves um, Chris, I'm going to give you the last question before we open it up to the audience. Um, uh, what can we expect from Frozen 3? <laughs> uh, <laughs> gosh, I don't know yet. You know, okay, honestly, the, the second one, we didn't uh, even think about it till about a year after the first one came out. These movies, as you will see, are so exhausting emotionally and physically that... Um, 
you know, you really don't have the, the headspace to even think about it. So I will, all I can say is we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. That's all you're going to give me. I said today in an earlier interview, um, <laughs> it's like, how about you guys get us a vaccine? When there's a vaccine, we'll start trying to talk about Frozen 3. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> That's kind of, what Frozen 3 should actually be, the search for I the just, vaccine. I just want to stress, this is all news to me, guys, that we're talking about this. <laughs> I mean, I have no power to make Frozen 3 happen, but I do have the power to at least be able to think about what Frozen 3 might look like if my children go back to school because there's a vaccine. <laughs> No and no, this isn't any announcement of Frozen 3. No, we have not talked about it. Chris yes, is doing a is. wonderful project right now. <laughs> Peter's doing a wonderful project. You heard Everyone's very busy. I, I think I heard that Frozen 3 is happening. So to the audience, <laughs> audience oh, members. <laughs> audience members, raise your hand in the interface and you will be unmuted. Um, if you want to ask about Frozen 3 or any other questions about this amazing docu-series, this amazing six-part event that airs on June 26, feel free to ask your questions now. All right, we have a question from Steven Sievers. Hi guys, uh, it was cool seeing that there was two songs that got cut from the movie. Would they ever be released at some point? Uh, some of those songs have been released already on the uh, on the deluxe soundtrack release. There's four of them, I think, on that one. And then there's a there's one that you can see in the documentary. I think it's "See the Sky," "See the Sky," which was the um, the Northaldra's song. And the only way you can hear that one is by watching mm -hmm. some of this docu docu series. So yeah, um, we've gotten a lot of requests to animate them because they're not. People ask us for a director's cut of things. I'm like, no, no, we don't. We don't really cut, we don't, animation is the, it's one of the most expensive, difficult parts of the process. So we either commit or we don't. Um, so we don't have animated versions of those songs, but we've been getting a lot of requests for those. Question from Jessica Mason. Hi there guys. Um, as a mom to a little girl who is obsessed with these movies, it is so important to me to have a movie that has so much diversity on it, even building on Frozen 1 and to go from Snow White saying, someday my prince will come to you are the one you've been waiting for. It's so powerful that for me as a parent. So I just want to talk to Jennifer and Adina and the animators about the importance you feel as knowing this movie will be so important to young people, especially little girls. Yeah, I mean, I do think we all talked about, I mean, Adina, Kristen, even with anim animators, we all talked about how important it was, and it was interesting because it was such an abstract thing to do that it's hard to get your head around story-wise, the idea that you're going to have the answer in Be Herself. Um, that's so, it's, it, you know, you, you're used to songs that it's a, it's a, it's a it's, it can be externalized uh, in a way that also drives the story. And this was in a show yourself in particular was a, an arrival of her into her true power. And we had never seen that for a woman for, and growing up, to know that you have the answers within you. And I, and I know early on, Kristen, it was the one thing coming in of saying, I, if we could ever do something like that for Elsa, it would mean so much to me to have that. And, and we got scared for a while, we couldn't pull it off because people would go, I don't know how to visualize something so internal. Um, and, but they were, it took the whole journey for us to do so, I think. But I don't know if the others want to talk about that. But. I mean, I would just add that um, if Frozen One was trying to open the lens of true love to include familial love. The thing I was so excited about when, when Jen and Chris and Peter came to us to do Frozen 2 was looking at, at the way that could we open the lens to finding your own power, finding your mm -hmm. own um, without anybody, without needing anybody, like that moment when, especially for a woman, when they realize like, this, this is my purpose in life. This is my path. This is what I have to say. Can really feel like true love too. And could we put that into the movie? Excellent. We have a question from Kevin Winston. Hi, this is Kevin with Digital LA and Yale in Hollywood. Uh, question relates to uh, 
when you cr were doing the documentary filming, like actually doing some of the behind the scenes stuff, did certain themes come out that you didn't expect? Uh, typically when you do a documentary, there's some, you know, two or three th things you want to focus on, but then inevitably something else comes out that was unexpected or, oh, let's follow this news story. Can you talk about that? Sure, yeah. I mean, when we started, we, I mean, we weren't sure exactly. We, we had blocks that we thought that we would be following. But, you know, we, as I said before, we, were, we shot for 115 days. I think that comes out to something like 1,300 hours of footage mm. that we had. Um, we had an extraordinary team of producers and editors who were, like, scouring every tape, not tape, every file, um, so that we could find those moments that connected because sometimes we would shoot a meeting, but then that wasn't resolved until like maybe a month or two later when that, you know, piece of animation had been finished or this piece of, you know, the song came into, was, was resolved. So we, you know, it was constantly evolving really. I mean, we, all we knew was that it was going to be the final year of production. And we didn't, you know, and truthfully, I don't think I really understood exactly what that was going to be because I didn't understand how animation worked. So it was a learning process for me as well to go through that and to see what, what issues were coming up and what, what were the real sort of challenges of making this and try and focus on those as well as the real triumphs as well. So it's a balance. There was a question from Jasmine Williams in the chat. Uh, she asked, with the first movie being such a phenomenon that is still a massive hit, even to this day, what were the key goals that you felt were most critical to meet in Frozen 2? I think, I mean, one thing I think, and then Chris can speak to this too, the key for us was not, it's, we have to be true to these characters and these characters are growing and evolving. So what we didn't want to do is just take a new situation with the characters as they are and, and, and do an external stakes story that we wanted to have the stakes come from them. So we had to do a lot of work to say, who are they, where are they now? Not with what the world zeitgeist is, but what they, they are feeling and being on the precipice of adulthood and feeling like we would only, if we built it the way we did the first one, committed to the characters, whatever happens, at least we could feel like we did right by them because I don't think we could, I don't think we ever expected to nor thought we could um, uh, sort of repeat the same situation of Frozen 1, particularly because it was a, the first, but I think we wanted to do it emotionally justice and have somewhere to go that was an evolution instead of just like a flip of a sequel. It's also super important to do that work when you're making a musical sequel because um, the songs are so much expressions of the characters in their situation mm -hmm. in the first movie that if you didn't reshuffle the characters and really throw them for a loop, there really would be nothing to sing about it and we'd be repeating ourselves and would feel very, very... Uh, Redundant. Very trite and, and repetitive. Um, so it was, uh, it was, that was another real challenge of making Frozen 2, making a musical sequel that felt fresh. But on a superficial level, one of the things Bobby and I said, if we got another bite at the apple, is we were going to write a song for Jonathan Groff to sing in this movie, because the first one was such a, such a I can't believe we didn't write him a song, Jonathan Groff, Broadway star. So we got to do that. And we got to do 18 Jonathans, because he sings his own backup. All right, a question from Alex Reif. Hi, everybody. I loved the show and especially just how personal um, it got. But my silly question is for Kristen and Bobby. Um, your trophy case uh, looks like your Oscars are wearing things. And I was curious if you can talk about who they're wearing <laughs> and why they look so fabulous. Yes. Uh, we, we, we were sent, a friend of ours makes these clothes. She has other friends that have won Oscars. Uh, I think it was Joel Gray, and she made she knitted Joel Gray's Oscar sweater, and then when we won, she knitted two little sweaters with a K and a B on it for them to wear, and then she made some more. She made little hats for those. She made little pink pussy cat hats for the Women's March, and that's what the Frozen the Frozen Oscars wear the pink pussy cat hats, and then the Coco Oscars have tiny sombreros. Oh, that's awesome. 
<laughs> I love that. Bobby and Kristen, are the Frozen 3 Oscars going to wear masks? <laughs> Protective here? I, I, this is a good chance for me to reiterate. That was a joke. And a, more of a motivation for um, let's get a vaccine before we talk about Frozen 3. <laughs> it was a chance to just celebrate science and how much we're all counting on science right now. Um, yes. The studio is not announcing anything. Jennifer Lee is still going to talk to me after this conference. <laughs> okay, one last question from uh, Jordy. Hi guys, I uh, appreciate your guys' time and, uh, and everything uh, that you guys did to create something so beautiful and encouraging. Um, but I wanted to talk more, and this is for uh, both uh, the talent as well as um, the uh, creative crew, but what would you guys think uh, fosters that creativity uh, within Disney animation that's so special? I know you guys talked about vulnerability, but is there anything else that came through the documentary that maybe uh, you didn't see um, that also was a part of that process to making something so special? Goodness, that's all, I can start, there's so much. I mean, I would say I think one of the key things is the collaborative process um, in animation. It is the most, I think, collaborative of, of filmmaking. It has to be. Um, and each one of us make up, that's here, make up these characters and bring them to life. Wayne, I'll never forget the moment of Elsa riding and right before she sings that wipe across her face that you did. Um, it's forever there. And it's, I think that's what makes it special. I do want to give a shout out to, we have the most sophisticated technology teams in the, in, in the world. And people think often, they think technology and animation, they don't think of that side. They think the creative only and the two, go hand in hand, uh, I, a frozen to the look, everything, every sim, everything that happens. So I think in terms of the, some unsung heroes that are in is, the, you know, over a hundred tech people who are designing software for us every second, keeping up with every idea. I mean, when you say, can we have something in water, an animal in that's made of water in water and on top of water, and they go and they design a software that's never existed to create that. I mean, I think to me, um, that's one of the parts that don't get featured, doesn't get featured much, as much that we're always so blown away by and is so critical to who we are. You know, I would say that, that, that it begins and ends with that collaborative spirit. Um, there's something so profound about uh, a group of people who look at, and, and it is sort of the, the running joke of this Frozen 3 thing, for example, is, is, is it's, it's the reality of you have to commit to something for three or four years with a group of people that you trust so fully. And when you take that journey, there's so many falls along the way. There are so many stumbles. But what's so beautiful about animation and in particular the culture of Disney animation, uh, and it's why these movies don't just speak to uh, the generation that they're released for, but speak to generations uh, to come in so many cases, is this idea that you are refining something and you're constantly trying to make it better. And you're constantly trying to never, ever let a single frame be wasted. Mm -hmm. And in a movie that is in both movies that are so much about the big moments, the things that I think make these movies transcend um, the, the, you know, their release date and transcend the times that they're in are the little details. It's the things like, I always talk about that moment when uh, Aduna, Queen Aduna does this to um, Anna's little nose or, or when Elsa in that moment when she sees the rock uh, elements for the first time is hiding behind the tree and she does that little smile that little like that the crease of her face smiles it's those little things that that it, it speak to the attention to detail and to every single animator and to every single composer and to our brilliant directors and our brilliant uh, talent and our brilliant producer is everybody goes into this and they go let every moment count don't let any moment go to waste. Because if you do that, then not only will it be special the second it's released, 
But every day thereafter that your kids or grandkids or great grandkids watch it, they will see it for the first time and have that same feeling of, wow. And it's a testament to the, the culture at Disney and the fact that my grandparents, when they were children, saw Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and my children are watching Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. That, that's it, that's the legacy. I would add um, one, one last thing that in these collaborations, it's also the ability to have the hard conversations, to be able to say, to call each other after a particular tough day in the story room or, you know, the filming was there and we didn't, we, we acted all weird or to be able to call up and say like, can we talk about what happened? I'm sorry, I was feeling very scared. I had fear there. I brought it into the room to be able to have those kind of conversations and to trust that you're always dealing with someone who can listen to those conversations really makes the difference between bringing, bringing, you know, your best self to the workplace or bringing your whole self to the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any final thoughts from anyone else before we have to say goodbye and travel into the unknown? I think that the sort of saying what Jen and Kristen were saying and what goes in, in tune with, with Elsa is that the gift and the curse of performance or the creative process, not just performance, what everyone is doing on this session is that being vulnerable is the only way to make great work. And so you have to be willing to do that in order to communicate with your audience. And so you have to be willing to jump off a cliff and be terrified and there's no other way through it. And I think that that's sort of what the, what Frozen is all about. This was really cool. I mean, um, we have, we have two animators on here, but we're just representing 90 of the animators, character animators, not alone, not, not even talking about the other thousand people that we have in that building like it says animation on the side of the building I always like to say like it really should say collaboration because yeah. it is this huge collaborative effort and I, it that's what makes it so special there the, you're asking about uh um what we didn't see on there on the docu docu series I, we, I I feel like we see so much but like there's so many moments where we're having conversations and we're just I would be having a conversation with an effects artist uh, when Elsa is running on the water and I'm in uh, her office, Aaron Ramos's office, and I see math on glass. And it's like, there's math on glass. Oh my gosh, that is the coolest thing. And like, it, and we've never seen Elsa do that. And like, this, there's so much genius, like from everyone that like, you know, makes these things possible. And it's just such an honor just to be a small part of that. And it's fun. Well, it was an honor for me to be here with you all. I thank you to the Frozen 2 family for bringing all of your genius to this project. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you again. No pressure, but <laughs> I do look forward to speaking with you again one day soon. Thank you to all the journalists who joined us today. We really appreciate you being here. And again, just so you know, please tune in June 26th on Disney Plus for the sixth episode of Vent. Again, June 26th, Disney Plus for the sixth episode of Vent. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, I know Lola. I speak for everyone when I say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bravo. Bye. Bravo. Miss you all. Lovely to see you. Love you guys. Love you. Bye.